just thought that because I'm not a size six, no one would ask me out. Well, not everyone feels like that. I mean, that's just your hang up, isn't it? Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 20 times the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air tackled serious issues. Being black isn't what I'm trying to be, it's what I am. I'm running the same race and jumping the same hurdles you are, so why are you tripping me up? For this list, we'll be looking at the most notable moments and or episodes that dealt with heavy real-life topics. Important plot points will be discussed, so beware of spoilers ahead. Which of these Fresh Prince moments stuck with you the most? Let us know in the comments. Number 20. Moving on. Closing a chapter of your life isn't always easy. And sure, we all bawled when Will turned off the lights. After all, for six seasons, we'd watched him grow, evolve, and develop under his family's watchful and caring eye. You're moving out on your own. You're gonna finish college in a year. You're becoming a man. Man I'm damn proud of. While saying goodbye can be hard, it gives Will and the audience time to reflect on everything that shaped him into the man he became. This version of Will is very different from the kid who first moved to Bel Air, and it's only because of that growth that he's finally ready to go out on his own. He looks back with nostalgia and forward with the knowledge that he's prepared for whatever life throws his way. I, I just don't want to lose you, you know, any of you. You're not going to lose us. You are my son, Will. End of story. That's something most people face at one point or another. Number 19. Grief. Season 4 takes a dark turn for Hillary when her beau, Trevor's big extravagant proposal goes tragically wrong. I ain't no bungee expert or nothing, but I don't think he's supposed to be slamming into the ground like that. While the moment itself is initially played for laughs, Hillary genuinely and understandably struggles in the aftermath and blames herself. Will even convinces her to move out of the pool house, where she shared plenty of intimate moments with Trevor. Countless romantic evenings. I, mean, I bet if those walls could talk, they'd whisper, Trevor. But we arguably see Hillary's deepest despair after she needlessly starts nitpicking the person that Will sets her up with. This leads her to finally confront her own emotions and find some closure. Sometimes I feel like we're still engaged. I mean, he died so suddenly, and I never had a chance to say goodbye. The story arc teaches us to be patient and give ourselves, or others, all the time and space we need to grieve. Number 18. Sex Education When Ashley gets the hots for and starts seeing her classmate Kevin, she turns to her cool older cousin to discuss the birds and the bees. I, you know, it's, it's just that I just need a little time to get prepared, all right? But I thought you knew everything about sex. <laughs> Will's caught a little off guard, but steps up. Well, he tries to. Later, he, Carlton, and Hillary debate the pros and cons of giving the youngest Banks child some education. She won't do anything stupid if she has some good, solid facts. <laughs> Wrong, my hot-blooded cousin. If you tell her about sex, she's just gonna run out and do it. Oh, that's ridiculous, Carlton. We want to expose her to a realistic portrayal of relationships. Ultimately, the guys visit a clinic to educate themselves before offering up advice, and it turns into an eye-opening experience for them, too. Thank you very much. No, wait a minute. And here's one about the prevention of pregnancy. Here's one about AIDS. And here's one about dealing with your emotions. It's also great to see the parents ultimately approach the subject open-mindedly. This episode proves that teaching people about how to safely practice intimacy is incredibly effective. Number 17. Second Chances In this episode, Will and Philip meet an ex-con named Luther, who must find a job or risk returning to jail. Unfortunately, securing employment is much harder for a felon, and even Uncle Phil, who knows the pitfalls of the legal system, needs a little convincing. Your Uncle Judge. <laughs> Uncle Phil, you could give him a job. Are you crazy? He's an ex-con. In fact, it seems like only Will's willing to give the guy a genuine chance. He even initially gives him the benefit of the doubt after his autographed baseball goes missing. Where's my Willie? Girl, I can't find my Willie! But when the family comes home to discover they've been robbed, all fingers point to Luther. Only, he turns out to be innocent. He stole my baseball and some other stuff. <laughs> I can't do that, sir. Why not? 
Well, we already arrested the perpetrator. Yes, his name is Edward Haskell. Claims to be your law clerk. It's a poignant lesson in not judging people by their past actions and giving them a fair chance to be rehabilitated and reintegrated into society. Number 16. Ageism. The anxiety that can come with getting older is all too familiar to many. You are the best-looking 40-year-old woman in this hemisphere. Philip, I am not 40. I will not be 40 until 7.08 tonight. 7.09 if you count my feet. When Aunt Viv hits the big 4.0, her birthday party pushes her to chase a lifelong dream. However, she soon becomes intimidated after struggling to keep up with the younger attendees of her advanced jazz dance class. It doesn't help when a couple of snooty dancers try to make her feel like she doesn't belong there. There's an audition here today. I know. Auditions usually require dance training. You haven't been to any classes. Unless you count Lamaze. But Aunt Viv refuses to give up, holds her ground, and figuratively laces up her dancing shoes. She outdances the competition, proving that age really is just a number, and that it's never too late to chase your dreams or realize you've cultivated new ones. For the last 20 years, I have wondered if I could have made it as a dancer. And now I know I could have. 20 years ago. Number 15. Body Shaming Will attends a Lakers game with Dee Dee, the daughter of one of his uncle's clients. Well, I just moved oh, up. Listen, Dee Dee, you know what? I don't think I'm gonna be able to take you to that game, right? See, because I got all this stuff piled in my car, it probably wouldn't be enough room for you. I mean, I mean, I mean, not just you, I mean, anybody. Although they seem like a match, he can't get past her weight. When they go to grab a bite later on, he's more concerned with protecting his rep than defending Dee Dee from the body shamers. <laughs> now, how you trying to play me? No, I ain't no, trying to play you, you man. seen the honeys that I had up in here. That's right, I can't figure out how a brother goes from T-bone to rump rose, that's all. And she hears everything. The pair only reunite later at a dance, where she calls out his shallowness, telling him that she has too much self-respect to waste time on someone who judges her body. You know, I do go on dates. Look, Didi, I just thought that... You just thought that because I'm not a size six. No one would ask me out. Well, not everyone feels like that. I mean, that's just your hang-up, isn't it? After an otherwise miserable night, Will learns a valuable lesson. You really like being with me as long as no one thinks you're with me. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's just not good enough for me. Don't place value judgments on other people's appearances, and find someone who thinks sticking straws up their nose is as funny as you do. Number 14. Social Justice and Giving Back It's widely believed that this episode occurs in the aftermath of the 1992 Los Angeles riots. Parts of Los Angeles erupted in unrest after a jury acquitted four white Los Angeles police officers over the videotape beating of Rodney King, a black motorist. Philip and Vivian take the family to their old neighborhood to help clean up. Will meets Noah, a resident who calls out those who feign altruism to feel good about themselves and how quickly they forget about those still trying to rebuild. I bet you feel pretty good about yourself, don't you? I mean, you come down here, do the right thing, and then you go home patting yourself on the back because you helped out the poor folk. Meanwhile, Philip realizes that while enjoying his well-earned life of luxury, he's forgotten some of his core values. You have worked hard for everything you've got. You've been generous and you've contributed to a lot of causes. It takes more than just writing a check. I've lost myself. I've lost my fire, my passion. As the family reflects on their history, various members vow to be more committed to rebuilding the neighborhood and giving back to the community. Number 13. Black History Will advocates for black history to be taught at Bel Air Academy, but quickly becomes disillusioned when it turns out to be more work than he expected. In fact, Will and Carlton, the only two black students in the class, end up being the least invested. I expect it to be at least 15 pages, typed double space with footnotes and the bibliography. This course was a brilliant idea, Will. She's your mom. Things come to a head when Aunt Viv confronts Will over his attitude, especially as he was the one who fought for black history to be taught in the first place. She tells him that the subject has more depth and complexity than he realizes, and that it isn't something to be taken lightly. Baby, you can read that book, you can wear the t-shirts, you can put up the posters, and you can shout the slogans. But unless you know all the history behind it, you're trivializing the entire struggle. Her words are important for him and viewers alike to hear. Now you started something very good here. But it's up to you, baby, to follow through on. The episode concludes with a powerful quote from one of Will's idols, Malcolm X. Number 12. Police Brutality 
Will and Jazz find themselves in court following a car accident with Hillary and her boyfriend Eric. Oh, I don't believe this. Your piece of junk just backed into the custom fender of a $35,000 automobile, pal. You're gonna have to turn in a lot of soda cans to pay for that. While taking the stand, Jazz stands with his arms raised and is reluctant to put them down. You can put your hands down, Jazz. <laughs> no way. Dude's got a gun. Next thing you know, I got six warning shots in my back. It's presented as a comedic moment, but there's a dark and all too real truth behind his fear. According to data collected by the Washington Post, interactions with cops ending in civilian fatalities have increased in recent years. I'm putting my hands down now. And a disproportionate number of lives lost belong to black Americans. Movements like Black Lives Matter are fighting to raise awareness and advocate for change. Still, this is an age-old injustice, and it's heartbreaking to know that not enough has changed. Number 11. Acknowledging Privilege In this eye-opening two-parter, we see various family members confront their own privilege and develop a greater appreciation for their fortune. Hillary and Carlton eat a big old slice of humble pie after spending Thanksgiving at a shelter. What kind of a narrow-minded, elitist view of the world do you have? I mean, you come down here once a year, give a guy a couple slices of turkey, and all of a sudden you think you're better than he is? Carlton's forced to face his prejudices, while Hillary learns that her photo op is someone else's day-to-day -day reality. Just because you volunteer a couple more days a year than I do doesn't mean that you're better than me. I didn't volunteer at all. Oh, so you're paid to be here. Honey, I live here. Meanwhile, Will and Uncle Phil end up in the slammer after an innocent mistake. There, Phil encounters an old college buddy and discovers how drastically different their lives turned out. My knee was never the same after that game. Lost my scholarship, I had to leave school, and then I got drafted. Ended up with a head full of shrapnel. Couldn't hold a job once I got back. Needless to say, by the time the family sits down to dinner together, they have a deeper understanding of their privilege. Number 10, your first time. Well, I love you, Ashley, and I think we should make love. <laughs> Together? Since the Banks house had a few teenagers around, it's not surprising to see scenes where characters are coming to terms with their sexuality. But a season six episode where Ashley questions whether she's ready to take another step forward with her love interest hit hardest. Fortunately, her older sister has great advice. Hillary addresses Ashley's feelings and concerns and ultimately empowers her sibling to make the decision that feels right. But I mean, Hillary, weren't you scared? Of course, everyone is. But I was ready. And only you know if you're ready or not. Not everyone has someone that they feel comfortable talking to about the birds and the bees. So during this conversation, Hillary may have acted as a big sister to many young people watching at home. I know you're aware of all the issues. And whatever decision you do make, I'm always here for you. Number nine, sexism. As much as we love this show, we have to admit that Will said a few sexist things. In the study of human sexuality. So for any of you slimmies who miss out, I'll be more than happy to demonstrate the contents of the book. There are a few examples of him speaking to women in disrespectful ways of making assumptions based on gender. Will occasionally had to learn lessons about his bias the hard way. On one occasion, a prank orchestrated by Carlton and Lisa wakes him up. I thought you were good, but you're not good. You've caused so much pain to so many women. You're just a dirty dog. Another story sees a female boxer teach him a lesson about assumptions. He and Carlton also engaged in a battle of the sexes with Hillary and Ashley. While there are certainly aspects of these episodes that didn't age gracefully, the main message about confronting sexist behavior is still relevant today. Well, I am not crazy, okay? This whole thing was a sorority prank. They wanted me to teach you a lesson. In what? Bladder control? <laughs> no. Respect for women. Number eight, interracial marriage. Everybody, this is Frank. Frank, this is everybody. Whenever the Smith sisters get together, you just know that you're in for a good time. But their relationship was strained when Janice revealed that she was engaged to a white man. Initially, Viola Smith is adamantly against the union. She even tries to prevent Will from attending the wedding too. 
The show makes space to fully detail why she's afraid of the union, while also making it clear that Janice is aware of the potential hurdles she may face in society. For survival, Janice, please don't marry this man. But Frank and I are aware of everything you just said, and we can handle it, sis. Thankfully, Will's words help convince Viola to see her little sister wed. The sweet conclusion to this episode gave us hope that Vi would continue to support her sister's love. Why are you all looking at me? Reverend, go on with the ceremony. We are paying you by the hour. Number seven, confronting mortality. Come on, Doc, I've got a heart like a bull. Well, don't take it for granted. Although the heart is the strongest muscle in the body, it also has the most responsibility. After ignoring warnings about his health, Uncle Phil suffers a heart attack. Everyone rushes to aid the fraternal figure, except Carlton. He has trouble seeing his dad in such a vulnerable state. To him, Phil is an invincible Superman and can't deal with that image crumbling. Carlton is finally challenged when Will confronts him. Their talk is full of harsh realities about mortality and parental issues. Look, I don't want to see my father with tubes up his nose, okay? Carlton, there's going to come a time when all he has is tubes up his nose. Not my father! Everybody's father! Fortunately, this raw conversation enables Carlton to finally come to terms with the situation. He realizes that it's more important to appreciate the time he has with his father than to avoid him out of fear. This revelation is followed up with a heartfelt conversation between father and son. I'm sorry I let you down, son. You could never let me down, Dad. I love you. Number six, class disparity. In the aftermath of a harsh and humiliating rush week, Will discovers Carlton wasn't accepted into the all-black Phi Beta Gamma fraternity. Me and Carlton got in? Well, not exactly. I mean, you're cool and all, but Carlton, well, he's not exactly our type. It soon becomes clear that this is due to the president's prejudice against Carlton's privileged upbringing. Will tries to spare his cousin's feelings. However, Carlton steps in with hard-hitting truth for the fraternity leader. Being black isn't what I'm trying to be, it's what I am. I'm running the same race and jumping the same hurdles you are, so why are you tripping me up? It's a powerful speech about not invalidating someone's identity just because they had a different experience. As the episode closes, Uncle Phil poses a rather poignant question about this intense topic. When the family responds by silently thinking his words over, the audience is encouraged to silently reflect, too. When are we going to stop doing this to each other? Number five, drunk driving. Look, I'm gonna go take Jackie home. Wait here till I get back. And you're in no condition to drive, mister. Will's ego gets the better of him when he starts competing for Jackie's attention. After getting completely wasted, he considers driving home before passing out first. He wakes up in a cemetery where he has a life-changing encounter with a group of poker-playing ghosts. The tone really shifts when he talks to Billy, a spirit whose life was cut short by a drunk driver. This talk hits like a punch in the gut. I was playing ball on the sidewalk. This car jumped the curb, took me out. The driver was drunk. Its heavy content makes Will finally realize what could have happened if he got behind the wheel while intoxicated. Even though it all turns out to be a tequila-fueled nightmare, we're sure that this lesson will stay with Will and the viewers forever. You know, I almost got my car and drove home tonight. Well, let's just be glad you didn't. Number four, substance use. When Will gets overwhelmed, his friend offers him a dangerous and illegal quick fix solution. I'm into whatever gets the job done. To me, it's just freeze dried coffee, <laughs> just in case. It's all but forgotten about until Carlton mistakes his cousin's pills for vitamins and ends up in the hospital. Although everything turns out okay, the guilt still weighs heavily on Will. He eventually confesses that he's responsible for Carlton's accident in a tearful and heartbreaking scene. Those pills that Carlton took, um, they were from my locker. What? Look, Uncle Phil, I was just keeping them in case I needed them. The episode highlights that irresponsible substance use can also endanger a person's loved ones. Look, all I know is that somebody real close to me that I love a whole lot could be dead right now. And it would be all my fault. After Will realizes who he could have lost, the episode ends with his family knowing how sorry he is. Number three, gun ownership. Let's have the money. Come on, come on. All right, hey, hey, it's cool, dude. Uh, Carlton, give him the money. 
During one of the darkest episodes of the series, Will gets shot while he and Carlton are getting mugged. An angry, scared, and incredibly vulnerable Carlton decides to take extreme measures to prevent something like that from happening again. A hospitalized Will is horrified when he discovers that his cousin has a gun. You walking around carrying a gun? What do you think you're gonna do with that? It's for protection. Carlton, Carl, well, man, what do you, do you think is that easy to just shoot somebody? He urges Carlton to see that his snap decision to buy a gun could cause more problems than it would solve. After a tense back and forth, Will convinces his cousin to leave the gun. I saved your life, man. I saved your life. You owe me! Now give me the gun, Carlton. The image of the bedridden young man removing the bullets as he breaks down in tears is incredibly sobering. While the issues surrounding gun control are complex, this emotional scene sends a simple message about choosing nonviolence. Number 2. Racial Profiling The plot of Mistaken Identity takes a dark turn when Carlton and Will get pulled over by an officer while driving a car that belongs to one of Philip's colleagues. Unfortunately, they end up behind bars. When Phil and Vivian come to their rescue, the officers continue to show more prejudiced behavior. Sit down. Hey, you don't talk to my wife like that. Now, wait a minute, buddy. Who the hell do you think you're talking to? Who the hell do you think you're talking to? It's not until a white man vouches for the young duo that the police finally start to work with the banks. But Uncle Phil is sure to get in the final word with a strong and impassioned speech about prejudice. So, officer, don't tell us to wait. And don't tell us to sit down. Just open that damn cell and let those two boys out of there. I'm going to tie this place up with so much litigation that your grandchildren are going to need lawyers. Even after they're released, Will and Uncle Phil make it clear to Carlton that this encounter is unfortunately not likely to be an isolated incident. If you were a policeman and you saw a car driving two miles an hour, wouldn't you stop it? I asked myself that question the first time I was stopped. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Parental Abandonment Hey, Uncle Phil, that is not cool, man, the way you dissing my father like that. The hell with your father! Philip, for God's he sake! He waltzes in here after 15 years? 14! Oh, oh, excuse me. Viv and Phil are skeptical when Will's dad comes back into his life suddenly after 14 years. Sadly, their concerns are proven correct when Lou flakes out on his son once again. This leads to one of the most iconic moments of the entire series and arguably one of Will Smith's best performances. Will, it's all right to be angry. Hey, why should I be mad? I'm saying, at least he said goodbye this time. The emotion is so raw that you can't help but get choked up during his heart-wrenching monologue. He's so convincing that many believed he was drawing on his own experiences. While it turns out that this situation didn't happen in the actual Will's life, his acting brought an all-too-real issue to the forefront. Cause ain't a damn thing he could ever teach me about how to love my kids! How come he don't want me, man? 